It's eight o'clock, this is the UK Tonight. The postcode lottery for stalking victims. Tonight, we're going to bring you Gracie's story. She was just 23 years old when she was stabbed to death by a former colleague months after she'd reported him to the police for stalking and harassing her. Well, now a coroner has warned the Home Secretary more must be done to help victims of stalking across the country. Gracie's parents join me in the studio tonight to outline what change is urgently needed. Also to come, a watchdog finds that shoppers are being overcharged for branded foods as big names push up their prices despite this cost of living crisis. One of those products is baby formula, which has gone up by more than 25%. We'll have the latest from our national correspondent, Tom Parminter, who's been investigating this story since the start of the year on this new development. Britain braces for another night of snow and freezing temperatures as cold weather health alerts are issued for Northern England and the Midlands. All you need to know is on the way. And remember this, I'll be catching up with the hero crane driver who carried out this incredible rescue of a man from the top of a burning building in Reading just last week. All that and more to come on The UK Tonight. But first tonight, the inconsistency in police efforts to tackle stalking that is failing victims, and in the case of Gracie Spinks, costing lives. 23-year-old Gracie was tending to her horse in Duckmanton when she was stabbed to death by a former colleague months after she had reported him to Derbyshire Police for stalking and harassing her. Well, the police have admitted multiple failings in how they investigated Gracie's complaints including categorising Michael Sellers as low risk. He previously behaved inappropriately to eight other women. Well, now a coroner has warned that stalking victims face a postcode lottery in how forces handle investigations, issuing a formal report and telling the Home Secretary more must be done to ensure consistency in light of Gracie's death. And that is something that Gracie's parents are campaigning for as well with plans for Gracie's Law to help other victims. And Gracie's mum and dad, Alison Ward and Richard Spinks, are with me in the studio tonight. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having Sarah. us. This is a big week for you. Mm -hmm. um, getting this report from the assistant coroner with the Prevention of Future Deaths report. I just want to first start by talking about Gracie and what she was going through, because as her parents, you were going through this with her. Mm -hmm. What was going on? Alison? Well, we first knew about Michael. He was a work colleague um, back in 2020 mm. and uh, just started really... They, they went out a couple of times as friends and um, went out for a meal, didn't they? And then um, it just started becoming a nuisance and it just got out of hand, really, with the messages. And then um, he was hounding a young... Mem another employer mm. from the company at Xbyte, sort of basically asking him to keep an eye on Gracie and it just got too much. Then one day she went to feed a horse, Paddy, and uh, Michael Sellers was waiting for her at the horse field, which really spooked her. She then went to work that morning in tears and reported him. And uh, through investigations at work, he, he lost his job. So after that, she then rang 101 to the police and mm -hmm. reported that Michael was not only a problem within the workplace, but outside of the workplace as well. And unfortunately, we now know that, you know, they did nothing, absolutely nothing at all, the police, Derbyshire Constabulary. Um, Richard, Gracie spoke to Derbyshire Police multiple times. The report talks about several errors in a limited investigation into Michael Sellers and, and missed opportunities. What did Gracie go through in her dealings with the police? She clearly felt like she wasn't being listened to and taken seriously. I think initially she, she thought that she was safe once she'd made that initial complaint, and I don't think she was given the proper advice. And certainly the officer concerned didn't uh, follow it through and investigate mm. and asked to see the records from the staff, which would have spooked her a little bit and... Um, made her think, well, he's done this to other women, I better warn Gracie. So she kind of thought that she was safe. She'd handed it over to the police, mm -hmm. end of, just carried on with her life and her routine. So I don't think it worried her too much at that point. She'd dealt with it. 
She told employers. She told... She, she'd taken some action. Mm -hmm. And as and, parents, we'd and, encouraged her to do and that, we've you know. That... Shelved the whole thing, yeah. yeah, yeah. We yeah. thought everything's okay now, and it went on like that for months. And then the worst happened. Her worst fears realised. I'm sure Gracie never even imagined it would, would get to this, no. and I'm sure you certainly didn't. As you said, when no. you're threatened or you feel frightened in that way, you go to the police and you hope that yeah. it will be investigated properly. As part of this investigation, this report has come out. Alison, what was missed? What opportunities were missed? There's a whole catalogue of errors whole of catalog, the, yeah. the, the police didn't do. Initially, with Xbyte not asking to see the records, mm -hmm. they just got his address and went to his home. Then it was a very haphazard sort of conversation in a park. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think that was firm enough. They should have brought him in and questioned him. There were no um, notes ever taken. Notes was there taken. Any opportunity? Yeah, their, their, their camera footage wasn't logged in. It wasn't logged into the system. Mm -hmm. um, it, then we move on to the bag, the yeah. lady that found the bag of weapons across the road from Grace's horse field, which they it's treated like, as lost property. Yeah, found yeah. found property which they thought was uh, acts from theatre or woodworking. Or, or woodwork. Yeah, I mean th there was no investigation done basically from start to finish with Grace's call and with the you know regards to the handling of the bag of weapons the the, the threat of risk they have a thing called thrive which is threat mm -hmm. and they measure the amount of risk and it was considered low um, it wasn't investigated mm -hmm. they didn't join all the dots they didn't tick the boxes they didn't follow procedures although, i don't think they had the training to do this yeah, to do was, their job properly i was just going to say although the call handler that took grace's call she did say that did see it as high risk yeah. and uh, asked even for um drive by drive pass to be done past our house mm. th which we didn't even know about that came out in the inquest and then also regarding the handling of the bag of weapons again the call handler saw mm. It was a high level of risk and asked officers to attend within the hour. So it was only then when the frontline officers actually mm. took it on, it, it just didn't get investigated at all. I think on both counts, both, am I right in saying that from the incident being um, spoken to with Michael Sellers at Rother Valley and the bag... It was a matter of was, hours. Uh, yeah, a matter of hours to be just being shut down and closed. We got the impression they just wanted to log in on the system, mm -hmm. put it away, forget about it, and get on with something else. It wasn't taken seriously. This is basic policing that wasn't done. Because, I mean, because stalking is an offence, and yeah. the sense yes. you get from this report, it's been described as a postcode lottery. Some yeah. forces have got a better understanding of stalking as a criminal offence than others. It talks about uh, this lack of consistency. Mm. We've heard that from the call hander mm. to how the, you know, the police officer who comes yeah. to talk to, to Gracie or Michael exactly. Sellers, how, how it's handled. Um, the Prevention of Future Deaths report that's come out, and that's been sent to Derbyshire Constabulary and to the Home Secretary, the new Home Secretary, James Cleverley, highlights six areas of concern to which they have 56 days to respond. What within that report stands out to you as something that needs to be addressed immediately? Was there something in those areas of concerns where you thought, that's it, that is something that simple? The, the setting on of a um, stalking coordinator and advocates to deal with stalking, but mm. very importantly, I think this should be underlined, is the training for the officers, proper training in stalking. It feels like the law has moved on, but perhaps the training and it's got to be throughout the that. country, which, yeah. which is our campaign. That's where we want to go next, to yeah. try and get all of the constabularies in the country mm. to have the same procedures and the same rules and regs that everybody follows. To take it seriously, yeah, yeah. to all have the same training, Absolutely. so everybody yeah. treats it exactly the same as the serious yeah. crime that it is. I mean, in our case with Gracie, you know, it, tragically we've lost her in the circumstances we have, but it all came down to very, very basic policing mm. that we were failed again. And a lot of it was just again, basic common yeah, sense. A lot of it was just so, so much common sense. Especially with the bag mm. of weapons. How are you both doing now? Because you're doing this in Gracie's name. Yeah. Asking for Gracie's law and, you know, just looking at this image behind us of Gracie with one of her horses. <laughs> um, you know, images like that just must give you the courage <laughs> to take this and push this, because this is something, you know, you don't want a report to come out, you want to follow it through, you want we to do. see this yeah. happen. There's a long way Matthew, still to go. Yeah, the coroner, Matthew Cooley's done an amazing comprehensive report mm. listing all the failings and we had an amazing jury, didn't we, at the inquest who 
were very attentive, asked lots of questions, and we you know we felt really supported by them, and and we're just supported by so many people, yeah. aren't we? I, th I think the thing that, that, that it's gone to the top now, it's yeah. gone to the Home Secretary yeah. and the Chief Constable of Derbyshire. Now, I can only work its way through down to make changes. If it comes from the top, then something's got to be done, and that's what we want. What would your message be to the new Home Secretary? You owe it to the public to hire the standards of policing. Mm. The, the, the public's faith in the police is not very good at all, especially in this case. And um, if it comes from the top, we hope that everybody will just stand up and, and make some changes, and we're going to be on this now. We're not going to let it go. I feel like Gracie is pushing me along and saying, Dad, do this. Well, I'm, I'm sure she is. I'm sure she's extremely proud of what you're doing. And like you said, you're not asking for big seismic mm. change. It's no. the basics. It's yeah. consistency. Right. And, you know, that is achievable. And, you know, that gives you hope. And thank you so much for coming on to the UK tonight to talk to us about the need for change and about Gracie. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Really good to meet you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Well, Derbyshire Constabulary has issued a response to the coroner's report that was out this week. Uh, this is from Def Deputy Chief Constable Simon Blatchley. It says, as was said following the conclusion of the inquest, we fully accept there were significant failings throughout the two incidents relating to Gracie. We are absolutely committed to providing the best possible response for victims of stalking and harassment. And since Gracie's death in June 2021, significant work has already been completed to tackle the failures that were identified prior to the inquest. There has also, over the last two and a half years, been significant changes to the ways in which we as a force receive and investigate stalking reports, as well as how we support and safeguard victims of these crimes. I also want to reiterate the force's sincere apologies to the family, friends and wider community. Now, the price of baby formula firmly in the spotlight after the Monopoly's watchdog said that price increases over the last two years have been unjustified. The Competition and Markets Authority examined the price of formula as part of a wider investigation into grocery pricing and following investigations by Sky News, which prompted the World Health Organization to say that UK families are being exploited. Our national correspondent, Tom Parmenter, has been following this story all year and reports now on this new interrogation of a market that is dominated by just two companies. Parents have long known the struggle to afford baby formula. Prices of this essential product have risen 25% in the last two years. But the Competition and Markets Authority say there's now evidence that the prices in the shops have risen faster than the cost of making it. It's frustrating. It's frustrating seeing these mums struggling, not being able to provide just because of the price of things. It's, it's not nice to see. Heartbreaking. And you'd like that price to be taken out of the equation? Yeah, fully. Fully, and I think it needs to be free. It has gone extraordinarily expensive, and, you know, can't see the reason why, really. I'd say lower it, cap it, make sure that families have actually got a chance to live. This year, Sky News uncovered the effects this is having, how parents are watering down formula, stealing tubs or buying second-hand open formula milk online, putting their baby's health and development at risk, as formula companies make healthy profits on products that nutritional experts say all do the same job. All first infant formula products are essentially interchangeable, they're nutritionally comparable, and the law requires this. So they can all be, they can be made from different ingredients, um, but at the end of the day, they must meet the strict um, legal requirements for nutrition composition to support um, safe and adequate growth and development. The two biggest manufacturers have an 85% share of the market. Danon, who make Aptamil, as well as Cow and Gate, say they're working hard to absorb costs and minimise price rises. Nestle, who make the SMA brands, say they've only increased costs as a last resort. Kendermill are the one British-based manufacturer. Their prices have risen too, but they acknowledge the formula market that they are part of isn't working for families. We would welcome more competition. We think families should have more choice in this industry. And we would also question some of the regulation, which in our opinion, perpetuates the status quo. It allows these multinationals like Danone and Nestle to continue their dominance. 
We want to work more closely with the government. We think there should be more choice in the market. We think prices shouldn't be as high as they are. The CMA review looked at other groceries like baked beans, mayonnaise and pet food. The same things are happening there. But you can get cheaper, own brand tins of beans. You can't always do that with infant milk. Parents need solutions from an industry that is under more scrutiny than ever before. Well, some hope for those desperate families that change is coming. Tom joins me now, and as I said, Tom has been following this story since the start of the year. Tom, how significant is today's development? It is. I mean, we're reporting tonight, Sarah Jane, from North Manchester, but the reality is we could tell this story from any part of the United Kingdom because as families have consistently told us through the course of this year, this is hurting them and really it's harming babies and it can't go on like this. You may remember just a few weeks ago we heard from the World Health Organization who told us on this program that this amounts to exploitation of families and that something has to change, the government has to take action. And now to have the Competition and Markets Authority saying that in their view it doesn't add up what is going on in the formula pricing in this industry it leaves big question marks that need to be resolved. The Westminster government consistently tell us they are helping with the cost of living crisis. We saw just last week the Princess of Wales at many of the baby banks that we've been reporting uh, from through the course of this year. She is taking a very keen interest. There is more and more awareness of the positions that families are finding themselves in because of those high costs and the demand for answers and solutions is growing. That is perhaps one of the criticisms of the CMA report today is that there were not any key recommendations and they have singled out baby formula now for further investigation and the expectation is that those recommendations and fit solutions ready for families that they may well come in 2024 at some point. Uh, Tom, thank you, Tom Parmenter, uh, with the latest. Uh, we will, of course, continue to follow the story closely on the UK tonight. Thank you, Tom. Now, people in northern England are preparing for another night of freezing temperatures, with snow and cold weather warnings ramping up from this evening. Uh, well, here you can see that the yellow snow and ice warnings uh, are in place across a number of regions until 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. Motorists are being urged to take extra care on roads with snowfall expected producing dangerous conditions. Well, it comes as the UK Health Security Agency issued warnings of its own with yellow and amber cold health alerts for Northern England and the Midlands until next Tuesday. Sky's Katerina Vitozzi has this report. For many of us, this was the first taste of winter weather. But as the snow and temperature fell, warnings followed. In North Yorkshire today, the weather made for pretty pictures, but also hazardous conditions for drivers. In Cheshire, which is part of an official cold weather health alert, warm spaces are opening once again. These are places like this church that are cosy and heated for people who might need a little extra support when it's chilly, and especially when energy prices are high. We knew that some members of our congregation were really worried about that and were talking about turning the heating off and in some cases doing things that were sounded positively dangerous. Along with singing, there's hot soup too. There's particular concern in cold weather for the over 65s or for people with underlying health conditions. What I find hard is when the roads are slippery. That's the biggest problem. But otherwise, I mean, we put the heating on, obviously, and think, how much is this costing? Because everything's going up, isn't it? But you've just got to keep warm, you know, when you get to our age. Yellow snow and ice weather warnings are in place today and go into tomorrow and Friday across various parts of the UK, especially down the east coast, places like Newcastle, Aberdeen and Norwich. But the weather, health and social care warnings are much wider, with amber warnings in Sheffield, Liverpool and Hull, and yellow warnings in Nottingham and Leicester. Health services have been warned this cold snap will add extra pressure, increasing the risks of stroke and heart attacks in the vulnerable and delaying discharges from hospital. 
we know there are people in hospital who should have been released, who should have been allowed back home, but the situation at home, so sometimes it is things like getting the house warm and making sure they've got support, that they've got access to warm meals, is their carer able to come? And then that means that the ambulances at the hospital are having to wait for longer because they can't get people in. And that means that at our end, we're struggling to get people who really need to go in, we can't get them in. It might not officially be winter yet, according to the calendar, but for public services in many areas, these freezing days are the first test working under winter pressure. Uh, well, Katerina joins me now live from Wilmslow in Cheshire and no longer in a warm space, Katerina, out there feeling the temperature for yourself. But even though this cold snap is only going to last for a few days, you can't underestimate the impact that it has. Yeah, and actually there's a lot of research out there that shows that more people suffer health conditions due to cold weather than they do in hot weather and extreme heat. And we spent the day in warm space, as you say, talking to people over the age of 65 who do talk about it being rather tentative journeys that they're taking outside if they are indeed trying to venture out and the difficulties of trying to keep their homes warm when you've got growing electricity and, and gas prices as well. But it was really interesting speaking uh, to frontline medical teams today. They are really taking this health and security agency, Amber Alert, seriously. Uh, that is, you know, being on the front foot when it comes to preparedness to deal with an increase in calls and demands for their services. But from the health workers we've spoken to today, they've said they've already, to be honest, been seeing the impact of these uh, colder temperatures that we've been seeing over the past week or so. People at increased risk of respiratory illnesses, but also uh, vulnerable people increasing in cold weather, the risks of things like strokes and heart attacks, and also then the impact that has, as we heard, on people being discharged from hospitals if they can't be discharged to a warm home if their own at-home health workers can't get to them because of cold weather, that can lead to that person then occupying a bed longer than they need to in hospital. It was described to us as being like a domino effect. And remember, this is just the very, very early days of the winter season. As I said in my report, it's not even officially winter yet, but we're seeing in places in the north of England, uh, temperatures tonight being up, you know, down to minus eight, freezing temperatures and health alerts, not only from the north of England, but all the way down uh, to the bottom of the Midlands as well. Don't underestimate for some people what an impact it will have. Katerina, thank you. Still to come on the UK tonight, we'll get the latest from the trial of two teenagers accused of murdering 16-year-old Brianna Jai. Shocking pictures have been released of an assault on a paramedic in London, one of more than 500 incidents in the past year. And not all heroes wear capes, but some do drive cranes. I'll be speaking to the driver who saved a workman from this burning building last week. I looked out my left window, and as I looked out my left window, um, one of the guys on the ground shouted out, there's a guy on level eight. Um, and I, I stopped what I was doing, and I looked out on level eight where he was, and he was waving his coat. I'm Inzamam Rashid and I'm Sky's North of England correspondent telling stories from this culturally rich region I call home. If the Taliban found your family, what would happen? I think they're just going to straight away execute them. 
there are issues of racism in all levels of cricket. I was on the balcony a couple of times. I was nearly gone. Football is a joy to watch. When people are disappointed, you can feel the hate. I've always tried to put people at the heart of the story, like hearing from young women who've been spiked via injections. I just felt physically sick. That's really in my system. Men, they want to force you doing something which you don't want to do just because you're homeless. We give a voice to communities often unheard and unserved from a region with a distinct history and global impact. Hello, welcome back. You're watching The UK Tonight. Here's what's coming up. We're going to be live in Nottingham, where the City Council has today effectively been declared bankrupt. And the government is promising a new national park in England. The big question, though, where should it go? We'll try to help ministers make their decision a little later. But first, the trial of two teenagers accused of murdering Brianna Jai has heard that they exchanged messages the night before she was stabbed to death where they discussed killing the 16-year-old. A correspondent, Sadia Chowdhury, is with me in the studio now. And quite frankly, some of these text messages make a really, really upsetting reading, Sadia. Yeah, it's the third day of the trial <clears throat> it was today, and the jurors had a chance to hear more text messages. We've heard a few already. Uh, and as you say, really disturbing material. Um, the two defendants are girl X and boy Y. We can't name them because of their age, but both deny uh, the charge of murder. Um, Brianna was found stabbed 28 times in a park near Warrington in February. The prosecution called it a violent and sustained attack. Now, I'll go through some of the kind of uh, material that we've heard uh, in, in the trial today, where girl X in the uh, text message says, I want to stab her at least once, even if she's dead, just because it's fun, and then ends that with LOL. So the prosecution painting a picture here of, like, a planned attack. And the night before the murder, on the eve of the murder, they're talking about the murder weapon. Mm. Boy Y is talking about the murder weapon he's going to bring, and Girl X says, definitely, 100% kill her, and then Boy Y confirms, yes. And it's very much in keeping with the kind of things we've heard in the last few days in the trial, where they talked about transgender people, um, where Boy Y says, I want to hear if it screams like a man or a girl. So, showing this very distorted and warped um, attitude mm. towards transgender people. And we heard more about Girl X's so-called fascination with Brianna uh, in those weeks leading up to the murder. Mm. And uh, we've got some footage now we can show you of the doorbell, from the doorbell of Brianna's home. And you can see these are the last uh, images of her. She's leaving her home, which the police uh, released just today. Uh, we also heard in court today from Brianna's mother, who uh, re had a statement read, read out on her behalf, and she talks about her daughter being someone who, was, who had a lot of anxiety and didn't really go out on weekends and mm. was, you know, quite afraid to go out by herself. OK, Sally, thank you. That trial continues. Right, let's take a look at some of the other stories making news in the UK tonight. And a coroner has said that four teenagers who died last week in Snowdonia drowned in their vehicle. Jevon Hurst, Harvey Owen, Wilf Flitchett and Hugo Morris were found dead last Tuesday after their silver full Fiesta left the road, overturned and was partially submerged in water. The boys had failed to return home from an overnight camping trip. The former Deputy Prime Minister, Dominic Raab, has rejected claims that Boris Johnson wasn't in charge of the government during the pandemic. Mr Raab and his former Cabinet colleague, Sajid Javid, both appeared today at the COVID inquiry. And Mr Javid told the inquiry that Boris Johnson was happy for his chief adviser, Dominic Cummings, to oversee decision-making. However, Mr Raab, who deputised the Prime Minister when he was in hospital with COVID, said he didn't agree. The broader question you, you rise, raise about whether he took he was actually the, Boris Johnson was a puppet. I, I, I'm afraid I don't find that a serious allegation. Uh, I think Boris Johnson certainly relied 
on his key advisers. By the way, I think you have to. Well, tomorrow it is the turn of Matt Hancock, the former health secretary, to give evidence to the inquiry. We'll have full coverage throughout the day here on Sky News and, of course, uh, we'll follow it on the UK tonight, tomorrow night. London Ambulance Service has released footage of a paramedic being assaulted by a patient outside the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital earlier this year. The male paramedic was pushed out of the door of his ambulance, landing on the ground and injuring his arm. The patient had already urinated inside the ambulance and shouted homophobic abuse. He was convicted and ordered to pay compensation. London Ambulance Service has reported 561 assaults on ambulance crews between April 2022 and March this year. And a 20-foot alternative Christmas tree made entirely from food items has been unveiled in Scarborough. The tree was made to raise awareness of food poverty and features the top 10 most needed food items this winter. The Trussell Trust, which teamed up with Tesco to put up this tree, says food banks are being stretched to breaking point and facing their busiest winter ever. Nottingham City Council has become the latest local authority to issue a Section 114 notice, effectively declaring themselves bankrupt. The council, which blamed its problems on cuts in funding and rising demand for services, is the second local authority to fail this year, after Birmingham issued a Section 114 back in September. Our political correspondent, Gurpreet Narwan, is in Nottingham for us tonight with the story. Gurpreet. Yeah, so we call this effective bankruptcy because councils, they don't go bankrupt in the way that businesses or individuals do. They are legally obliged to balance their books at the end of the financial year. And when it looks like that might not be possible, they issue something known as a 114 report, what you and I would call effective bankruptcy. In Nottingham's case, we saw this coming. The central government has been keeping a close eye on its finances for some time now, and in issuing this 114 report, it confirmed that it has a funding gap of £23 million. That's largely because of a massive increase in demand for children and adult social care services, a rise in homelessness and, of course, inflation which is tearing into local authority budgets up and down the country. Not a coincidence that in the last two years we've now had nine of these 114 notices issued by local authorities. And all of this, it's indicative of the pressures that they're facing after more than a decade of real terms funding cuts from central government. Now, back in Westminster, that's something that they'd be eager to dispute. Rishi Sunak earlier this month blamed the slew of 114 notices on what he called the financial mismanagement of Labour-run councils. It's something that Robert Jenrick, the immigration minister, echoed today following this announcement. He repeated that line on Twitter, both of them perhaps conveniently ignoring the fact that around this time last year, a Thurrock Council also issued one of those notices. That, of course, is a Conservative-run government. Not to say that Nottingham can shy away from this. It's been hit by a series of mismanagement scandals. But at the end of the day, it's local residents that are picking up the tab. The Council now has 21 days to come up with a new budget that will inevitably involve painful and deep cuts to local services. Gurpreet, yeah, thank you. This has come on the UK tonight. We'll have the latest on the Royal Book Row as the Dutch translation of a new book about Harry and Meghan is removed from shelves. Uh, this is after it named two royals alleged to have raised concerns about the colour of Archie's skin. And also on the way, my interview with the hero crane driver who rescued a worker from this burning building last week. heard the cage go down and the banksman said he's in he's in so um and, I, and then i heard the crowd outside they all they were all shouting as well i could hear all that as well so um yeah and then up and away
Hello, welcome back. You're watching The UK Tonight. Now, last week, we brought you the incredible rescue of a workman caught up in a fire at a tower block in Reading. You'll remember this footage. Well, the crane operator that rescued that man, Glenn Edwards, has been hailed as a hero after using a cage to rescue him, the man trapped by the flames and with no other means of escape. Well, the rescue man was treated for smoke inhalation in hospital, but Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Service said things would have been very different if it wasn't for Glenn's actions. Well, I met the man himself earlier on today and asked him to tell me what happened. Well, I heard the fire alarms go off and uh, one of the guys, the banksman on the ground, said, uh, this, is, this is not a fire drill, this is evacuate everyone out. And uh, there's a fire on level eight. Um, I was concreting at the time, and I, I looked out my left window and I could see the smoke. So I, I just hoisted up and slewed round to get, put the uh, concrete skip on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they said, yeah, you have to come out the crane as well. So um, I, I started, I got the skip off and my chains and I started hoisting up. And I slewed back round and I looked out my left window. And as I looked out my left window, um, one of the guys on the ground shouted out, there's a guy on level eight. Um, and I, I stopped what I was doing and I looked out on level eight where he was and he was waving his coat. From watching the video footage of that day, you could see him desperately yeah, trying to get in yeah. the cage, but inching back because yeah. the smoke was so was thick. The smoke and the heat. And you could see the area where he was standing. You knew he yeah. didn't have that much space. No, he had about two metres. He was standing about two square metres there. Uh, that wasn't a light. So um, and when I touched down the cage, there was materials on the floor. So the cage started to tilt a little bit. Um, yeah, and uh, the wind caught the block then, and it started pulling the cage over. And I thought, no, lucky it came back. And um, then I heard the, heard the cage go down, and then the banksman said, he's in, he's in. So, um, and, I, and then I heard the crowd outside, they, all, they were all shouting as well, I could hear all that as well. So, um, yeah, and then up and away, back, pulled the lever right back as fast as I could, get him out of there. You are in the right place at the right time in terms yeah, of you were yeah. in your cab, you yeah. were told to evacuate it, but yeah. you heard that someone yeah. was there, so you stayed in. And like you said, you've done that manoeuvre yeah, yeah. many, many times. Yeah, I've been, I've been on that level before, yeah. But from what you're saying, you were operating blind, you yeah. and... Oh, your man on the ground yeah. worked together. Yeah. What was that like? What were the nerves like? Uh, the adrenaline in was out the roof. Like the, I, I can't tell you. I, you know, when I, when I got him back on the ground, put him back on the ground safely, and and the uh, ambulance staff was there. Um, yeah, they they got took him away and they took my hooks off and I blocked up and everything, got the crane safe. And I just stood up, and my, you know, I, I was shaky as hell, like, you know. The, jelly legs. Oh, yeah, jelly legs, the, yeah, the drilling. Yeah, and then, then I had to get all my stuff together <laughs> and climb down 90 metres. <laughs> so, and yeah. what happened after that? Because we've all seen that footage, you yeah, know. Yeah. <laughs> It, it went viral because it was so dramatic yeah, and your yeah. rescue yeah, yeah. was so calm and collected. Yeah, yeah. But within hours afterwards, if you looked at that tall building, you know, you would think nothing no. had happened. No, it was right. over and done with so quickly. Yeah. What, what's been the reaction since oh, your it's, rescue? It, it, uh, <laughs> it's been phenomenal, actually. I've, my phone hasn't stopped, obviously. Um, there's a guy called Jordan. He set me up a GoFundMe page. Well, apparently, I don't know, that's gone out the roof, apparently, mm. uh, which is very nice. You know, and I'd like to thank everyone that has donated, it's, that's been amazing. Um, what does that mean to you, that kind oh, of response? It means a lot. Just, you were just doing your job and your instinct and, instinct and your yeah, training John, as well. Yeah, some of the comments and that, uh, uh, you know, have just been absolutely fantastic. You know, I've, I've sat down this afternoon and had a read through some of them. And you haven't yet met the man oh, you I rescued? Haven't, I haven't met him at Are all Are you going yet. to? Oh, yeah, yes, I hope so. I'll, yeah. yeah, oh dear, yeah. He's got to take me across the road for a drink yet. <laughs> <laughs> but you had... Did you take a bit of time off as well? Because I would imagine, no, no. you know, no, straight no. back to work. I, I, went in, I went into work uh, next morning 
Have you have you seen the footage? The footage that was taken seen, by some yeah, of the bystanders. I've, I've seen, yeah, I've seen. I don't want to get into it too much, like, mm. but I've seen a few bits and pieces of it. Yeah, it's a bit of a yeah. It's um, it's out there, isn't it? Is it back to the day job? Or are you switching careers to be a full time hero? Oh no, um, you know? yeah, yeah, I'll have to, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to hang my cape up for a little while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, not all heroes wear capes. Uh, a lot of them operate cranes. Uh, well done to Glenn, and thank you uh, for speaking to us on the UK tonight. Uh, now, two members of the royal family who allegedly raised concerns about the colour of Harry and Meghan's son, Archie, before he was born, have been named in the Dutch version of a new book about the couple. Endgame by Omid Scobie has now been pulled from shelves in the Netherlands. The English language version of the book does not name the two members of the family. Our royal correspondent, Laura Bundock, has this report. Same title, same author, but these two books tell a very different story. With a Dutch plot twist that's resurfaced a British royal race round. And it's all about this incendiary interview. Also, concerns and conversations about how dark his skin might be when he's born. What? And who, who is having that conversation with you? What? That conversation <laughs> I'm never going to share. Um, but at the time, at the time it was awkward, I was a bit shocked. Their comments caused controversy and created a crisis within the palace. We never knew who made the offensive remarks until perhaps now. The Dutch version of a new book names names. By mistake, the author Omid Scobie claims. I edited and wrote the English version. There's never been a version that I've produced that has names in it. The book describes letters sent between Charles and Meghan after her Oprah interview. The English edition says that in the pages of these private letters, two identities were revealed. Laws in the United Kingdom prevent me from reporting who they were. But the Dutch version is different. Reading, but in those private letters, the identity emerged and was confirmed, and we've redacted the name mentioned. It comes up again in the Dutch book here. Meghan and Charles by letter discussed probable unconscious bias within the family after it was revealed that, and again, we've redacted the two names, took part in such conversations about Archie. This whole section isn't in the English version. Copies of the Dutch book have been cleared from shops and the journalist who spotted royal names revealed believes lawyers try to prevent this detail being published. I think they sent it to all the translators all over the world who were translating the manuscript, except for one country, the Netherlands. We're quite small, so easily overlooked, I don't know. Overlooked or lost in translation, it's another reminder Harry and Meghan have left royal life, but still make headlines and uncomfortable reading for the royal family. Laura Bandock, Sky News. Coming up on the UK tonight, the government promises a new national park in England. But where will it go? And Owen Farrell is taking a break from international rugby. So what does that mean for the future of the England captain? When people actually see it in person, when thousands of people came along to our Christmas lights switch on, and really enjoyed the event. And they saw it all lit up. Um, they uh, and they saw all the coverage that uh, the media have uh, given it. Um, they um, they've just learned to uh, love it. They see it as quirky and funny, uh, very much like uh, the people of March themselves. Well, it would take more than a couple of beer mats, I think, to uh, straighten up our tree. The fact is that it's put in place perfectly um, straight. The problem is that the tree that we were delivered has got uh, a bend in its trunk. So um, although it looks like it's leaning over, um, it's actually in the ground perfectly um, straight. Um, so th there's nothing wrong with the way that it was installed, which uh, sadly um, many of the people on Facebook um, who first um, 
um, complained about it, uh, assumed that it had been put in incorrectly. Uh, it would be nice for uh, for our lovely uh, market town of uh, March to get this much publicity uh, next year um, because there's so much going on here. On Saturday, we've got our Christmas market from uh, 10 in the morning till 3 in the afternoon. I hope lots of people will come along to that and uh, they can see the tree for themselves. <laughs> Coming up on the programme, we're going to try and decide which area should become England's next national park. It's not a final vote, it's just a discussion, just so you understand. Uh, but first, Teddy is here with the sport and big news from the world of rugby with the England rugby captain Owen Farrell um, saying that he's sitting out the Six Nations or taking a break from international rugby for the foreseeable future. What's yeah, fascinating one. It came from his uh, club actually today, a little bit earlier on this afternoon. Saracens announced that Owen Farrell will be taking a break from international rugby for his well-being. No exact specification of how long it will be, but they do say he'll miss the Six Nations, which is, of course, the next big tournament after just come out of the World Cup leading England to the semi-finals there after going into that and being suspended at the start of it, kind of earned his redemption through the tournament as England had that run, underdog run really, coming into it after a real losing run in 2023. But they will perhaps have a big job on their hands to replace him. February the 3rd, they go to Italy in the first game of Six Nations, ends mid-March at home to, away to France, sorry, which could be another seismic clash. He's got mm. huge experience, 112 caps. He's kicked more points than any other England player, even more than Johnny Wilkinson yeah. surpassed him at the last World Cup, led them to the final in 2019. So it's a big one. And the mental well-being aspect of this is interesting because it references the statement from Saracens, his family too. Mm. And Steve Borthwick, the England head coach, put his support behind him, says he'll do his best now to, to help him through this situation. He says it's a courageous decision by Owen Farrell, but one that leaves Borthwick with some, uh, some questions as well in terms of what he does for his fly half and his, his captaincy. Yeah, well, good on Owen Farrell for making that decision for what's best for him and for his family. It's for the foreseeable future. It's not, you know, he's not... Not specified, no. He's yeah. 32 years of age, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So he's taking a break. But, like you said, that does pose some interesting questions for Steve Borthwick. What's been the speculation today? Because, of course, that was rife as soon as this announcement was announcement was made as to who will captain the Six Nations, because it's not fa that far away, really, is it, February? No, absolutely. It's the transitional stage as well, isn't it? End of the, the World Cup. Courtney Laws, one of the vice-captains, has, has retired. Ellis Genge was Steve Borthwick's captain at Leicester. Maybe that could be him. George Ford, the fly half, will think will step up, but will it be Marcus Smith at fly half? So George Ford then wouldn't be the captain. So lots of questions, but we will uh, we'll wait to be seen in the next couple of weeks if anything becomes a little bit clearer ahead of the Six Nations coming up fast. Uh, so that's the big rugby story on a busy night of football. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people, more active. Live life with Vitality. Welcome to Old Trafford. Thanks very much. You're a man of many talents, but we're interested in you today for one major reason. Okay. Season ticket holder at Manchester United, and you tell me you're in the where? I Come. think I believe I'm in I'm in the E of Manchester towards the, the the back of that bottom tier there. Every time I sort of do a, a, a job or sign on to something, I always think, well, at least that's my season tickets secured <laughs> for another season. It's always my priority. I'd, I'd hate to be without it. Can yeah. you have any recollection of that the first time you actually walked through the steps or the pitch, saw the players? 
Oh, I, I, just, I just couldn't believe it. I, I, I've got very, very clear memories of that game. It was New Year's Day, uh, 2003, and we played Sunderland uh, at Old Trafford. And it was, it, was kind of, it was kind of the perfect first game to go to, really. That was in the era when we, when we had, we had Scolzi starting, and we had, we had Beckham starting, and we had Keno starting. And I just couldn't believe that I was seeing them all of a sudden. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Right, the weather is cold. Let's bring you the update. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, it's going to be cold all week. Overnight frost, fog and a risk of snow and ice. Largely fine for this evening, but there will be a scattering of wintry showers, mainly near northern and eastern coasts. Devon and Cornwall will see more general rain edging in. Wintry showers continuing in the north and east tonight, while the far south can expect more general patchy rain and hill snow. Elsewhere, it's going to be mostly fine with an extensive frost and some freezing fog developing. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Uh, now we're going to leave you with something a bit different uh, tonight. The government announcing a new plan for nature in which they promise, not for the first time, to create a new national park in England. Natural England will consider locations for the new park, with the government making the final decision next year. Well, to try and help ministers with that decision, I'm joined now by Elaine King, Chief Executive of the Chilterns Conservation Board, and Chris Peak, who is a tour guide in the Cotswolds. So, we've got about three minutes, so it's an elevator pitch uh, style of interview. Elaine, first, the Chilterns, let's go. Why should uh, that be the home for a new national park? OK, well, I must start by saying there are some, there's a fantastic network of protected landscapes across the UK. We're one of them. Uh, the Chilterns itself is a beautiful patchwork landscape of rolling chalk hills, ancient woodlands, um, magnificent beech woodlands, um, ancient hedgerows, and we have nine globally rare chalk streams. Um, there are only around 220 in the whole world, and we have nine of them here. And so it's a beautiful landscape, but it's also very accessible. It's only 35 miles away from Trafalgar Square, and you can get to us directly from the tube. So in terms of benefits to, to people, we know that lockdown um, showed that how, how being out in the landscape and enjoying nature can benefit people's health and well-being. Yeah, and Elaine, I have to give Chris equal time. And, and you make a good point there about your proximity to London because that's part of what the government is talking about. It's about getting kids from the cities out to explore nature, to see it for themselves. So accessibility is key. So you score a big point on that. Chris Peak, uh, you have been running tours of the Cotswolds for 20 years. Talk that's to right. me about why the oh. National Park should be there. Hello, Sarah Jane. Well, yeah, I mean, I have been a tour guide for... I lived in the Cotswolds, actually, for over 50 years. It's actually already England's largest area of outstanding natural beauty. It's about 800 um, square miles altogether, consisting of beautiful, gentle rolling hills, um, thatched cottages, limestone, oolitic uh, limestone uh, buildings, um, covers uh, five counties, um, parts of Gloucestershire, Oxfordshire, Warwickshire, parts of Somerset and Wiltshire, stretching all the way from Stratford up and Avon down to southwest, down to Bath. Um, also accessible from, from London by train, takes one, one hour, 40 minutes. Um, we already have Americans coming over to the Cotswolds, enjoying all the natural beauty, it hasn't changed in for centuries and centuries, you know, um, even the, the Industrial Revolution, you know, since then. Things have never changed since then. Um, just a beautiful area to visit. Oh, do you know what? I'm so glad I'm not making this decision because both are beautifully executed mini pitches. Thank you so much. I feel like we should send this as a tape to the ministers deciding because, of course, this is a Conservative floor. manifesto <laughs> pledge um, and lots of other places in the running. It's a story we'll continue to follow. Elaine and Chris, thank you so much for your time on the UK tonight. We'll see you tomorrow night at 8.